I'm afraid that that uh, my inhibitions are lower over Zoom because <laughs> I don't I don't have anybody like kids looking at me saying that's a dad joke or whatever. Well, I'm going to get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Susan, and I'm a bookseller in the Children and Teens Department at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning in to this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. Before we get started, we have some housekeeping notes. Please note that closed captioning is available for today's program. Click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select enable transcript. Politics in Prose is delighted to partner with DC Public Library, the DC Public Library Foundation and PEPCO for an inspirational program about the craft of bookmaking with a wide variety of guests who have worked together to present two of Levine Carrito's newest books. A is for B, an alphabet book in translation and Freedom, the story of the Black Panther Party. This program is presented in conjunction with DC Public Library's Know Your Power Summer Contest, sponsored by PEPCO. Teens are invited to submit an original work of writing, photography, illustration, or music that expresses their feelings on a social issue that matters to them. We'll drop the links into the chat for more information about the art contest. For those of you who opted to get complimentary copies of today's books when you registered, you can pick the books up at the Alma Thomas Teen Space at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, found at 901 G Street Northwest in Washington, DC, beginning tomorrow, July 27th. These books are generously donated by the District of Columbia Public Library Foundation. Please note that the complimentary book copies must be picked up by Saturday, August 6th. We'll also drop the book purchase link in the chat for those who weren't part of the complimentary copy offer, offer and would like to order a copy for your home library. Audience members, you'll have a chance to ask your own questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you see your question is already there, you can bump it up in the queue by clicking the thumbs up button. I'm excited to introduce our many special guests, but before I do, I also want to introduce our DCPL Teen Council member who will be moderating today's panel a little later on. Ednetta Fulmore is a rising senior studying anthropology and sociology at Lafayette College. She's a Washington DC native who spent much of her earlier years at LeMond Riggs Library. She's a lover of all things book, and she's currently serving as youth services intern at the MLK Library. She is grateful for the opportunity to learn about bookmaking, as are we all. And now on to our guests from Levine Corrido. Ellen Heck has received degrees from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and Brown University. She works as a printmaker in North Carolina, and she's the author illustrator of A is for B, an alphabet book in translation. Arthur Levine founded Levine Corrido in 2019 after a 23 year tenure as president and publisher of Arthur A. Levine Books at Scholastic. He had previously served as editor in chief at Knopf Books for Young Readers. Arthur still edits between eight and 10 books a year. He is Ellen's editor for A is for B. Jetta Grace Martin is the debut author of Freedom, the story of the Black Panther Party. She is from San Francisco Bay Area. Jetta is also a dancer, performer, and choreographer who's performed nationally and internationally. John Key is an artist, designer, and writer, originally from Seal, Alabama. He began his career in advertising before moving on to work with such clients as HBO, Nickelodeon, the Public Theater, and the Whitney Museum. His venture, Codify Art, is a multidisciplinary collective dedicated to creating and producing, supporting and showcasing work by artists of color, particularly women, queer and trans artists of color. John is the designer for Freedom. Nick Thomas is the executive editor and executive editor at Levine Corrido. Previously, he was senior editor at Arthur A. Levine Books, where he started as an editorial assistant. He's also held positions with Bloomsbury, Chicken House and David Fickling Books. He edits middle grade and young adult books and is the editor for Freedom. It is my pleasure to turn the event over to them. Thank you. I know I'm going first. So um, 
I will just say Arthur and I were were planning this presentation and decided to focus on just the many versions and drafts that went into making A is for B. It's a it's an alphabet book. The main thing about it is that it doesn't really work in English. So every page um, <laughs> is fun to say. B is for monkey, C is for parrot, all the way through you read um, the alphabet. My screen keeps moving around because it's trying to find my face. Um, <laughs> the alphabet book, and then also we'll see other languages where actually that animal does start with that letter of the alphabet. So um, I'll I'll show the four distinct lives of this book until it, it, it achieved this state, and uh, and then we can move from there. Uh, the idea came when I was reading an alphabet book to my baby when he was only about one, and it happened to be a Lithuanian alphabet book, and I got to B. There was a picture of a monkey and the letter B. I could not remember the Lithuanian word for monkey, which, by the way, is bezjone, which is why I couldn't remember it, <laughs> And um, but it was fun, and when I said B is for monkey, it was just funny to say that. And so I read the whole thing through like that, thought this was fun. What was that? Would other people like an experience like that? And so that was when the idea started. And then I began thinking, you know, B is for a monkey in Lithuanian, probably B is for any letter of the alphabet. You can imagine there's 7,000 languages on earth. So surely. And so I started doing some research and here I'll switch over and share my screen. <laughs> You'll see it was a it was a very different animal, um, as it were. <laughs> as it were, here share my desktop. Uh, Hi, Edmetta. Hi, Edmetta. Hello. How are you guys doing? I'm so sorry for my tardiness. There's been a lot going on. No worries at all. Don't worry. Um, Ellen is, is looking for to share her screen. I'm trying. And in the uh, meantime, I'll tell you that my son is going to Lafayette. Oh, oh my gosh. Incoming freshman? Yeah, yeah. That's so exciting. I'll be there in a few weeks. Uh, yes. 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 How is he feeling? Yes. Excited. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. My sister is excited for him in the background. You can see. <laughs> Oh, Helen has disappeared entirely now. Oh no. Well, should we jump jump in and do uh, freedom while we're waiting for Ellen? Or what do you think? Why don't you go ahead, Nick, and do that? Sure. I'll text Ellen. Yeah. Jenna, why don't you go first and then we can transition to Mr. Okay. Key? Um oh, there yeah, she is. I can uh famous oh there you are do you maybe do you want to just keep going <laughs> Ellen, is there, yeah. everything all right there all right when i shared my screen uh it decided it decided to say goodbye all right is can can everyone see my screen now yes yes okay i apologize for that anyway um so yes uh the the idea at the time was maybe you could find the word monkey starting with every letter of the alphabet and let's just see. So I started doing the research um, and the answer was, yeah, pretty close. The first draft, I could find monkey starting with almost every letter of the alphabet, but a few. And so problem solving, what could happen? <laughs> and the first draft of this was a really complicated story in which you'd see these different languages, but there was also this underlying narrative where you're at a zoo, um, it's all done in the style of the London underground to show that everything is connected. Um, the <laughs> monkeys are at the zoo and then they see a banana and they steal the banana and then they try to uh, make a banana split. And there's this big fight, who's gonna get the banana? And then an elephant reaches in at the last second and steals the banana, the end, okay. So there it was. That was the first. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Maybe it's a little too complicated. It was kind of, it was like that. So I, I had a, 
a, me a critique with um, Giuseppe Castellano, who's an art director, and he said, whoa, you know, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> Why did you make this book again? And um, that's a really great question to ask. So like, why did I why did I want to make that book? Oh, because a lot of people read alphabet books to babies. It's a really common thing to do. And yet it's not super stimulating for the adult if you're reading it in your native language. And really, babies don't learn the alphabet for about half a decade. So it's kind of a weird thing that we do reading these board books of alphabet books to infants. And so I said, well, it was because I wanted something for the reader and I wanted something for the baby. And so he goes, OK, back to the drawing board. So it was it was back to the drawing board. And this time the book became a board book. OK, it's a board book. And now we're going to use animals from all those different languages. You still have the idea that a lot of languages are are the same and different and sound differently and start in different ways but it's a little bit more straightforward. And then the question was, what's the art style? And traditionally my art looks more like the, the, thing, the, the style you see on the right, but because this was for infants and their parents, uh, we thought just developmentally, babies are really drawn to black and white. So that's when the idea came, you know, we're gonna do this all in black and white and just keep it simple. So the second draft uh, is when I began the scratch board. So I, this was the most fun part for me, just sitting down, finding these animals, puzzling it together, making it work. And these are all five by seven scratch board drawings. And the idea was that they would be small illustrations, but then they get zoomed in and you could really see the texture, uh, which would be a nice, nice thing about having it printed commercially. And so this was the state of the book when I met Jordan, who um, is my agent. And she said, I think I think we could take this somewhere. Uh, I, I think this is good. But oh, could you could you add color? Sure. No problem. <laughs> so then I did another version where we added color. And this was the version that Arthur saw. Uh, it had changed now to Z is for elephant. And it was just a really simple board book that you would read a, a young child. Uh, the concept is there that you can see those letters hidden in it. Um, but, you know. Go slower, go slower. Oh, go slower. And then I love the end. <laughs> but that's what you saw when you thought, um, and, you know, luckily, it this really fit in in the world of Levine Corrido. So it was, it was wonderful that, to have a place for this to go. And Arthur said, this is great. Um, now we're going to take it into Levine Corrido's world where it's going to be uh, a more traditional picture book, large format, full length, um, maybe ages five to nine, which is a new audience. And also the Q part of Corrido, uh, Corrido and the Dutch publisher would like to publish it simultaneously. So, um, that means about one third of the animals and letters need to be changed because they work in Dutch. And so the, the point is they need to not work in Dutch. So for example, W uh, needed to be changed. So this was great. I was like, you know, over the moon. Um, and again, uh, went back to the drawing board. So uh, here's kind of what my notes look like for finding the animals. Cause sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't, it, it was a, it was a puzzle. And then we moved to spreadsheets. Um, and this is my spreadsheet. And the cool thing yeah. is Carito has their own spreadsheet for fact checking. Yep. And then, and then I presented a fourth draft to, to Arthur. And this is what that looked like. So this is when finally the title was A is for B, which it's just a testament to how amazing happenstance can be because it wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for the Dutch publisher making us change A from monkey. And I mean, I think maybe one of the best things about this book is the title. So that, that was lovely. That was a salute to multiple drafts. And then um, you'll recognize it starts to look more like its current self. Um, 
but the color was a lot more subtle and there was just typography set in. Uh, I'll just scroll all the way through. At which point, um, Arthur then passed this to John Gray, the amazing designer. And he brought in uh, Pops of Color. And so this is, at, at that point, Pops of Color and hand lettering. And that really livened everything up and made it a lot more a lot more fun. Uh, so here were some of our ideas. At one point we thought we might try to have a, a map of the earth to show where these languages were. Uh, how are we gonna handle the back matter? But um, but in the end, this is this is the fourth and or fifth or four point 112 version of that original idea. Um, and and this is this is how you'll see it. Uh, in, I don't know how to, oh, well, good. so this is how it is in its current iteration. We speak to each other in many languages, and in some of them, A is for B. And then you'll see on every page the different languages um, that, that sound like they would start with that letter or actually do if those languages are, are written in the Roman alphabet. And so, there it is. There's our our project with many many hands and much help uh, to put this together, and I'm just very thankful for that. So, thank you. <laughs> there you go. I you got to share my screen. Uh, how do I un? I pause share. No, resume share. I stop share. Yeah, that would be great. Stop share. Ah, thank you. So there you go. Okay. That was awesome. That was great, Ellen. Thank you. And the transition is that that many, many great designers are, are named John. Yes. That's true. With no H. J A O N. <laughs> right. No H. If they have an H, they're not a good designer. <laughs> Indication I love that. of genius. Yes. That was so beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much, Ellen. Jenna, do you want to kick it off? Sure. I love that was such a seamless transition. <laughs> I'm still like wrapped up in the world of your book, Ellen. I'm like, oh, I have to transition. <laughs> and I have a six-year-old, so I can't read. She's a, she's a very literal person, so it's going to be very mind-bending for her to try to read that book. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, hello, my name is Jetta Grace Martin. I am one of the co-authors of Freedom, the story of the Black Panther Party. Um, yeah, it looks like that. <laughs> I have one too. Um, yay! I'll just talk um, for a, just a, a little bit and then I'm gonna uh, hand it over to John, who I'm so excited we've never actually met. So I'm like geeking out and like <laughs> so excited. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to be a writer since like forever really. Uh, both my parents are professors and I used to write on my dad's typewriter. He has this little blue typewriter as people didn't have computers in their homes yet. <laughs> I'm not that old, but they didn't have computers in their homes yet. And so I would type my little stories on my typewriter and I had my um, kind of like a period of time where every story began with, it was a dark and stormy night. Luckily I evolved. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I used to go into libraries and bookstores, two of my favorite places in the world, and sort of stare, you know, at the shelves and say, maybe one day I'll see my name there. And so now I can, which is amazing. <laughs> um, yay. And it was just so, uh, to hold this in my hand was just like a really amazing and important moment for me. Um, writing this, I wrote this with my dad, who's Waldo E. Martin Jr. His name comes third, so it seems like maybe he's my son, but <laughs> he's actually <my> dad. <laughs> um, And um, his colleague, Joshua Bloom. So they wrote a book called Black Against Empire, which was a comprehensive history of the party for adult readers. And I mean, technically, probably anybody could read it, but it's like 500 pages <laughs> and it's um, building on like decades of research. And so um, they were approached to write a, a young adult version or a young adult story of the Black Panther Party. 
And so um, I think this idea had been going around for a while and they were trying to figure out how they're going to do it. And it's so funny. I think we we're in like at the kitchen table. My dad turned to me and was like, would you be interested in this? I'm like, of course, daddy. Like, come on. <laughs> you know how much I want to be a writer? Like, duh. So um, we started working on it all together. And they're, they're both academics, sociology and history. So we had all these like theoretical heady conversations. And I was like, okay, y'all, we need to figure out <laughs> how we can write a book for, and not just young adults. I've had a lot of my friends uh, come to me and say they really enjoyed the book, but uh, the idea was to uh, write uh, in, I'm kind of like a novelist, that kind of person at heart. I watch a lot of movies. And so for me, I wanted it to really feel almost like a page turner and kind of like being like, you know, watching a movie. And so one of the first things I did, which I feel like neither of them would have chosen to do is I had a vignette, but it was um, not chronological. It wasn't in order. It wasn't like in the chronology. It didn't come first, but I was like, you know, you just want I read a lot too you just want that moment where you pick up the book and you can't put it down like what is that thing and so I just thought okay let's try this vignette and um luckily it was well received because then I got to uh work with Nick who I'm a big fan so that was really really great and then we started kind of working on we had a Pinterest board isn't that right Nick you made a Pinterest board big time yeah we had a huge Pinterest board so we had this really intense Pinterest board and I'm like so old school. I was like, how does Pinterest work? And I had to figure out a sign <laughs> it. <laughs> and then we were going back and forth on the different pictures that should be in it. And um, so we were looking at a lot of pictures that involve young people. We were really, I really wanted to reflect this in my words and also in the images about the women of the party. It's very important to me as who I am and also just to uplift the stories and the images of the women in the party. So we worked a lot on that together. And then all in the beginning, all I had was like a, a collage that John had made. So I just kind of saw the collage and was like, oh my gosh, this is so dope. Like, this is so cool. How am I gonna live up to this level of coolness? I'm like, I can't, so don't worry about it. <laughs> just keep writing. <laughs> and then I got to see the whole layout and I was like, this is so beautiful. Like even right down to the font that feels like you're reading a 60s pamphlet and these cool, yeah. They're these cool little triangles, you know, me being me to, to do chapter breaks. I had some sort of like cutesy little stars, but you know, those turned into cool triangles. I was like, this is so, I don't know. It was just so beautiful to see it um, evolve. And just like this, y'all, yeah. like in my, on my bookshelf, like it's just like this. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Back so, of her ass. Yes. I'm like, this is it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I writing, co-authoring a book, writing and collaborating with two other people was a very interesting experience, <laughs> but the book was def definitely made better for it. But that is its own thing, writing with other people, a book of this length and this scope and also this, what, you know, what it's talking about. And then to also be working with another artist, like I was just so... And like holding it in my hand, I wish I could describe like you know, when you have a dream and you work really hard and you try to tell yourself it's going to happen, and especially with writing, sometimes you're staring at that blank page and you're like, oh no, <laughs> wait, <laughs> nothing's here. <laughs> so then to actually hold it in your hand and be like, oh my gosh, we did this. It's just, it's a really great feeling. And it's so amazing to be able to share it with other people now too, to see other people hold it in their hands. <laughs> it's also super cool. So I want to make sure we have time for uh, John to sort of show some of the different iterations, but yeah, I think that's yeah. all I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, Jetta. Yeah, I'm going to quickly go through this presentation, but it has a triangle, so hopefully I don't get shut off. But if I get shut off, I'll be right back on. Um, allow Zoom. Oh, that's weird. One second. Great, I'm gonna try one more time. There we go, perfect. Not my email, can everyone see my screen? Yes. <laughs> awesome, freedom. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna be quick. Um, I'm John Key. I run a graphic design studio in Brooklyn called Morcos Key. 
Uh, my partner name is Wael Morcos. I'm John Key. So it's our last names put together. This is our glamour shot from our old studio space. Mm -hmm. uh, me and our partner. Uh, we recently just moved spaces, but we're a graphic design studio, which means that we do so many different things. Posters, these are examples of posters that we've done in the past. You know, some of our earliest collaborations, some are silk screens, some have illustration in them, some have Arabic typography. We do exhibitions. So this is an exhibition that we've done with the Cooper Hewitt Museum called Hear, See, Play, Designing with Sound, which is, a, you know, about how do sounds work in a city? And, you know, our job is to make these graphics and to design these tables and these, you know, illustrations and figure out how all of these things come to life in the space. Um, we also design magazines and books, which is why I'm here today. Uh, the 10th magazine was one of my first kind of earliest print projects that I did, which is a black queer fashion and lifestyle magazine that kind of, and this issue is blending together the print world and the tech world and kind of bringing them all into one space. Uh, this is another issue that we did for them that features the amazing trans artist Michelle Michelet here posing in this beautiful house in Hudson. Um, and then maybe another book that some people know, Black Futures, which was edited by Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham and features hundreds of artists and designers and makers and writers and thinkers. And so we loved collaborating with them on this project as well. Um, but that brings us to freedom. And I think this was such a special project. And I think it was, I, I think it might've been one of our, my first collaborations with, with um, Levine Carrito. Um, so it was really exciting. Yeah. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go through kind of what got us to this final version of the book or the first kind of drafts that we did. So this is a design presentation. We normally present these for all, like every single time we present a book and normally there's like, you know, a call to action here. And then, oops, kind of slow. But in here we have like three different directions that we presented to the client, to these guys here. The first direction was really inspired by, you know, obviously we're talking about the Black Panther Party. We're talking about looking at their newspaper prints and the different kind of typography that's here. And even like this artwork that's really beautiful that stands out here. And typefaces, I think one of our jobs as graphic designers is to find the typeface, the font that really brings to life what the story is. And so I love this typeface that kind of had this kind of width differences and it kind of felt like it was hand done as well. Um, and so that kind of gets us into some of the covers. So the original covers we were thinking about, could it be these focus on the, these black iconic objects and people? So like, you know, uh, Afro, like Angela Davis's beautiful Afro and trying to figure out like, how does all of this typography and text start to work together for a cover? Um, could it be a black power fist for the cover? And I think that was kind of an exciting, also super simple striking cover against this kind of golden yellow. Uh, like I said, like the typefaces are really important. Like how do you actually you know you're reading this text in a book? You know, it's things that need to be legible, needs to be easy to read. So for us, we really wanted to find typefaces that were easy to read, but also kind of had a sense of the period and the time that the Black Panthers was taking place. And how can we actually bring that into this contemporary story that we're telling? Um, this idea was like, oh, maybe there could be a flip book at the bottom of it. And like, maybe we can have this little panther jumping across the pages. Um, it does not jump here, but um, so yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's like figuring out how all of these different things come together in a graphic design system. There were images, there was typography, there was text, there was words, there was quotes, there were all of these different things. And so how does that actually come together in a page? So, you know, and I think this is actually more or less kind of what the book ended up turning out to be. Um, so yeah. you can see one of the things that I love about this is like, they have all these historical photographs to actually show you who these people are, which I loved. And, you know, for us, it's really figuring out how do all of this come across the page. So this is kind of a large bleed image going across. So it's the first direction. And so we have a couple of more directions. Like we love this idea of the stencil typography here in this sign. And could that be a way to bring to life again, like this idea of protest in the book? Um, and so again, also we love this idea of collages and people. And could that start to be like, you know, a central image for the cover? I think this was the first iteration of the collage actually that we made that yeah. uh, we kind of were inspired by. But again, it has Huey in the middle and all of these different people, you know, um, a part of the party. And so different typefaces here, kind of a different configuration here, but still kind of has a very similar energy, like trying to be legible, trying to be nostalgic, but also trying to find moments of 
modernity and contemporariness. Um, here, the images are full bleed, which is also really nice. And the last version that we made was, again, of course, inspired by, again, the Black Panther newspapers, but also could it have like this beautiful kind of serif typeface perhaps for the actual cover? So we kind of leaned into that a little bit more. This is another iteration of the cover. And this is actually really close to what the final cover was besides it was black and the collage changed a bit. Uh, ah, boom, there we are. Um, kind of closer to the final iteration of the cover and more covers. So yeah, I mean, I think this one is trying to find a really interesting pointy serif typeface here versus like this really bold sans serif typeface here. And yeah, and again, like how do the, all of these kind of text and vocabulary and different texts come together to create, you know, this world that Stone will read and enjoy and be immersed in. Um, and so, yeah, the overview for this is like all of these different covers that we made, we made three different directions. This cover was the cover that we kind of leaned into and continued to develop more. And I think it was like the first actual direction that we kind of used for the interior of the book to continue to develop as well. But yeah, that's what I have, super fast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that was really amazing, really cool. I saw a couple books that I have actually read that I, I assume you have done some work on. So that's really, 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 really dope to see. Um, I do have a few questions. Well, I have a lot of questions for all of you all. Um, and I just want to start with a guiding question of how did you all get into like the craft of bookmaking? What was your start and what prompted you to kind of, you know, lean into it? I can go first. Um, I uh, always was a big reader. My mom was a librarian. Um, I worked at a children's bookstore in high school and uh the son of the owners was an, and is an editor, a children's book editor. So I always knew that was a thing. And uh, I was lucky enough to get an internship with Arthur when I was in college. And then that was kind of, that was all she wrote. Yeah. Wow, okay. All right, we'll do the editors first. So I, I um, you know, my mom was an artist uh, and I loved poetry. Um, and you know, always read and loved and tried to write poetry. And when I finished, got to the end of college, I was trying to think, oh, what, what can I do with that to pay the rent? <laughs> and I thought, well, art and poetry equals picture books. Um, and so that's what led me into the, the one, you know, publishing art form that combines those two things all the time. And, and it's not not just picture books as we've seen with freedom, you know, that in, there's an intricate combination of graphic and and um, literary elements that make that book what it is. That excites me. I love that. I'm seeing a recurring theme of like, um, your family having some type of influence on what you do and creativity yeah. being passed down. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What about you, create you creators? It was similar <laughs> for me. Uh, we, you know, I loved kids' books, picture books. We had a big collection. My mom is an artist, and my younger siblings are much younger. So you get the benefit of being able to read them for a lot longer than you normally would. Um, and then I became a printmaker. Uh, so it's kind of like an artist in between like fine art. <laughs> and, and, and so I always, I always wanted to make a book, but wanted to, um, with printmaking, you're sort of in between uh, uh, replicating something and on a mass scale and then making a unique thing. And so I always wanted a real reason to, to step from um, traditional printmaking where you are printing from a letter press or a copper plate or a wood plate or something like that and then printing digitally. And I wanted there to be a real reason to make that jump. Um, and, and so it's fun to try to find that reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, I, um, I've always loved books. I've always loved paper. I've always loved the smell of ink on the page. 
Mm. <laughs> but it wasn't until I was in high school that I realized that was like graphic design was like a thing that you could do. Um, and so I basically switched my whole life in high school and started doing designing books and started doing all this stuff. So I went to art school for college in Rhode Island and I, you RISD? know, really, yeah, I went to RISD for, for undergrad. Yeah, Rhode Island School of Design. And that's where I learned how to like actually sew books and actually bind books and actually put them together and also design books and actually think about, you know, the structure of books. And ever since then, I've been completely obsessed with books. So our studio designs a lot of books now for so many different people. And it's like one of my, it's one of my joys. It's amazing. I think, I think, uh, some, Jetta, you might've said it, but just like, there's such a joy to like holding the book in your hands like that. And there's nothing like it. And when you find something you've worked on for years and you, and it's tangible, like there's no, it's so rewarding. And you smell it. Uh, I was going to say, when you brought up the smell of ink, I've always really liked the smell of paper, but I especially like the smell of like really old books. Like there's like a copy of Fahrenheit 451 that my family has, it like smells very good to me, <laughs> but it's like even just like the smell of older books. And I thought it was so funny that you didn't say RISD, you were like a school in Rhode Island, the way I'm like, oh yeah, yeah I went to school in Cambridge. Um, yes. Come on. Let's <laughs> <laughs> um, but so called out i love it <laughs> it's all love it's all in love. in called in <laughs> called in right called in um i think I, that's for me it's a hard question to answer because i feel like when i think about myself as a kid i was always doing creative things like my poor parents would find like months old paper mache like in a jar you know like in a corner somewhere you know like i was always had a project or something i was doing to express myself creatively and then I got into dance when I was really young. Like I started taking classes when I was four and um, then you had school. And so there really wasn't much time, but you know, school and dance, but I was surrounded by books, just the way our, our family was and the way the house was. And I was always going to libraries and bookstores. And I don't know about any of you, but you know how there's that thing that you do whenever you have time, whenever you can. And so for me, it was reading and writing. So it's like, if you ever have time, like my nose is in a book or if I ever have time I'm writing. And so it's hard for me to pinpoint and say like, this is the moment when I wanted to do this because it's always been a part of my life, but you never know if you're going to be fortunate enough for it to come to this level, right? But I definitely have a book. There's probably this person still out there. I, instead of a lemonade stand, one time I had a book selling stand. <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing. Right. Uh, sleepover and I drew this book and it's called something like Teddy's Day. And he like did this stuff and he got, he got a cookie out of cookie jar and his mom was like, it's okay. I like drew this whole thing and someone bought it. <laughs> so there's a person out there who has Teddy's Day. <laughs> wow. So that was my first book. There, it was only one one issue, <laughs> self published. Love it. So yes, I've wanted to do this for a you while. Sold the entire print run, Jetta. Yeah, oh, that was so, wow, so successful. Yeah. It's like the the Wu Tang Clan, right? They made like one copy of their album and sold it for like a million dollars. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for so for for all of those answers. It's so funny because. I could tell all of y'all really love books and writing because you guys like the smell of the page, the smell of the ink. Like that's really, that's really hardcore. Like I'm passionate. I love what I do. I love books. I love writing. And that's such an inspiring thing to know that from a young age, you guys follow what was interesting to you and what you found enjoyable. And so it's very commendable. I love it. I love it. Um, I think my next question for you all, is kind of just about the relationship between the editors, the illustrators, and the writers. Um, do you guys kind of like, I don't know, how often do you guys, are you guys in communication with one another? Is there ever a moment in time where like the editor is giving tips of what the illustrator should do and vice versa? Like, what does that relationship look like? It's really interesting because, uh, uh, you know, Alan and I j just had like one of uh, one of the, you know, our early, com early conversations about a book uh, was last week or was it this week? I lose track um, last week. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I think it, it varies for what point you are in the project um, for how often and how long you talk. 
And, you know, we just kept, Ellen and I just kept going through the 40 minute Zoom sessions <laughs> and restarting it, you know, just trying to, um, trying to figure out what the book was. And my job, in, you know, Ellen generates these ideas. And I think I consider my job, and Nick has heard me say this a million times, um, it's just to be the a reader. Um, uh, and I, I say, so this is what I thought, you know, I got, I understood this. I, I didn't quite follow this. What, what were you trying to say? Oh, okay, well, that, that came across here, but not here. Um, and, you know, so I'm not so much as saying, do this, Ellen. I'm saying, here's what I got. Would you say that's accurate, Ellen? I, I think it's accurate and wonderful and amazing. I mean, you saw from my presentation how drastically the first book changed. And, um, and I love that now. But I will say that back in high school, giving a paper to my mom at the 11th hour and I'd be like, will you, will you edit this for me before I turn it in? If she found anything, I was not happy. <laughs> so that means, and, and now I, and now I realize what editing really is. And it's please find something. There's not a deadline. I, I mean, eventually there is a deadline, but in the beginning, there's not really a deadline. And you really do have time to sit down and say, what worked? What didn't work? How can you problem solve what didn't work? Or um, where did it take you? Um, so I, I'm so thankful for every moment of critique that comes along. Um, and it's nice to do it early on rather than close to the 11th hour. <laughs> and I don't even think of it as critique at all. Oh, uh, yeah. We're, yeah I, I like to think of it as critique, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, just a conversation, just a feedback. Yeah. I would say I'm free. I mean, I'd be very curious to hear what John and Jetta have to say. Um, I think John and Jetta were both really exceptional to work with. Um, you know, so for Jetta, it's she was, you know, in a some potentially difficult position of, you know, being you know, a co-author, but really being the lead author, right, on the book. And so she's going and writing this book and then taking feedback from two other people and then also myself. And so it can, you know, while obviously we're all in a lot of alignment on, on, on different things, both in terms of aesthetics and ideals and all that stuff, everyone will naturally differ at times. And so Jetta had to like kind of absorb all that feedback and then proceed with it as, you know, still with her vision for the book. Um, into like a cogent hole and she did it, which is really kind of incredible in a way that made everyone feel good and also incorporated the best bits of their feedback while ignoring the less, the less good, you know, on all sides. Um, so, and then with John, I mean, this is a, there's like over a hundred photos in here. It's a really complicated book to design. And it's also very hard to be a designer and like, come up with like genuine, like creative, like genius, I would say, while also taking feedback from people. And so John is someone who was able to say like, you know, you know, take feedback from me or from Jetta and the other authors, and then like come up with something amazing. Um, that isn't exact, he's not listening to us art direct, and, you know, put this here and this here or whatever. He's like, right. I take your general feedback and then I make something beautiful uh, from it. A lot of emails and phone calls, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, from my end, that sounds that sounds just about right. I mean, luckily, you know, there I think there was a really great mood board that was pulled together for this book when we first initially talked, Nick. And I think that, you know, the text was really inspiring because we got some sample pages originally also. And so typically yeah. when we get when we start a process, it's nice to like read a little bit of what the book you know, what the book is about, read a summary, but also read the actual language and figure out like, how is this coming across from the page? Um, and then, yeah, then our job is just to like, try to find the best colors and typefaces and margins to tell that story. Um, and it's nice to be, to work with people that really trust what we, what we do and respect what we do, which I think makes a, makes a collaboration so much more rich for everyone, right? When you really trust the people that you are working with in the, 
work is the caliber that you're working with the work is so high so it makes it easy i think i think it, it, from in both directions it's it's really fun to both to love the work of the person that you're working with and i i mean i i know that like so i i just uh, I love Ellen's work, you know, so it comes back to me. I'm like, oh, yes, great. I love it. And I'm sure that you must feel that as well, John, like, you know, that, you know, when you're when you were sending stuff to Nick, he wasn't going, Ugh, you know, he was like going. I mean, I can tell you he was like running into my office. Look how cool this is, you know, like, and, you know, you feel that 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 is working that is a relationship that works also when there's a, the energy goes both ways and you like you you anticipate e excitement and 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 appreciation on and both 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 ends it's such a relief and a joy like i remember when i got your that presentation john and it was like oh like this person like gives a shit and like this person like really absorbed the material and puts so much thought and talent into this like thank you you know right yes i was just gonna uh quickly add that um uh, since this is my first book i kind of didn't know what the process would be like and it's exciting for me to know that some of what you were inspired by john was something i had written <laughs> this really means a lot to me that's actually really exciting because when i saw it i was like oh well this is so beautiful and it feels to me like a piece of art, like having a piece of art in my home and it's like has my name on it. It's a book that I wrote, but it's because of like the way that, you know, you designed it and how you were inspired to design it. So knowing that you had some of my words is like really exciting. Um, I so I didn't know what it's going to be like. Right. I mean, I'm working with my dad, so I know my dad's schedule. Right. We can get Josh on the phone, but I had never worked with Nick before. And it's like so. I don't know. I, I don't want to get overly emotional, but it I it was it was so like it was so good to work with Nick because like he will tell it to you like it is, <laughs> and then you see the book get better. And I don't know, it was just really an exciting thing to be like, okay, this is a person who I can talk to and we can work together. And you see it like not exactly like a flower, but you see it blooming, like you see it getting better, you see it evolving. And so it was really nice. And it still is really nice to have a working relationship with someone like that. So yeah, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, but also a lot of just like, I mean, I'm my Berkeley hippie self is going to come out, but a lot of gratitude. Cause I'm like, it's not, it, it's, can't, it's not just you, you alone can't make it happen. It's like a creative team. It's a collaboration. It's being open, you know, like I'm a very sensitive person and I know what Ellen's saying. Most of my parents are professors. I wouldn't want to give them my papers because they would always come marked back marked up two hours before they were due. So yeah, being able to really uh, be working with people who you feel like, oh, I can trust them. Like we have a good like, communication and then being open and knowing that because you trust the people, the book is going to be better for it. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. That's amazing. That's amazing. I figured... Um, from all of you guys' answers, it seemed like y'all have mutual respect and love for one another's work. Um, and I love that it it feels like a sense of community. Cause I know sometimes when you work with people, it's like you can set stuff off and it's just like, oh, okay, like what they gotta say. But like to have it to actually have a relationship where people are interchangeably exchanging ideas and, and being like, okay, I like this, I'm like this, what are you thinking? I really, I really enjoy it. Oh. Yes, we do have, yeah, we have some questions from the audience. Um, can, I quickly, and I gonna... can I just quickly uh, add on one, one thing about what, what you were saying? Because I, I think that the other wonderful and exciting thing to, to me about the sense of community is also the sense of mission that, that binds all of us on this screen together. Um, and that, you know, we, we, we are a publisher, um, and we are about making great, beautiful books, but we're also about um, changing the world for the better. Um, and you know, when when that's palpable, that makes a difference too. I don't, I don't know if that sounded Berkeley hippie-ish, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> okay. No, that actually in the best possible that. way. <laughs> okay. I agree. Um, okay. 
Um, wait, Nick, did you have a question before I read two of the questions from the audience members? No. My question is, what are the questions for the audience? From the audience? Okay, keep asking. Um, so CD has a question for Ellen about how long did it take um, from conception of your book to selling? Like, what was that time that gap in between? Uh, I know that answer because of researching it last night. So the <laughs> so that event of reading the story happened in 2016. So I was toying with the idea um, until about 2018, at which point I did draft number one, critiqued it, and then it changed 2019. I did the whole process of looking for an agent slash submitting to publishers 2020, <laughs> then 2019 and 2020 passed. And then, and then once Arthur, you know, adopted the book and put it in his nest, things, things went quite quickly after that. Um, so, so it's, I guess the idea was born in 2016 and the work really started happening in 2018. And ever since then, I've always just slowly been working on it. Um, but like a lot of other parts of my work, uh, along with a lot of other things. I mean, I'm always working on about 10 different projects and they're all at different stages. Some projects are at the thinking stage, some are at the working stage. And so it sort of depends. Um, it's nice to be able to move from one to the other. It's nice to be able to say, I have 25 minutes and I have a 25 minute project or I have three hours and I have a three hour project. So um, there's a lot of burners in this kitchen. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. That sounds like a very long process, but worth it. <laughs> very, very worth it in the end. Um, this next question is from Donna Wells, and it's to everyone about how do you select the team for each book? So I guess kind of mm, build off of my question previously about what your dynamic is like working with each other, but specifically now, how do you guys select who you want to work with? I can just say, I mean, with freedom, um, I, I had read uh, Joshua Waldo's like adult scholarly book and reached out to them maybe like 2017 or 2018. And we just kind of kept in touch. And uh, they, they, were, they had proposed um, for Jetta to come on board as the lead author. And I was like, Waldo's daughter? Like, oh God, this, who knows? And then... Uh, <laughs> And then I actually read Jetta's writing and I was like, hell yeah, like, yes, please. And uh, so that that kind of just took off from there. And then I think, John, maybe I think I saw your like the man in the purple suit pieces. I feel like I, I, I don't know. I'd seen some of John's artwork. John, John is like selling himself short. He's an incredible artist just on his own. Um, and so I feel like I had wanted to work with you. And then I, I'm pretty sure I saw the, um, the book you did with uh, One World um and was like oh wow and he can really design too and so um turned out to be the perfect choice for freedom yeah i i think that um you know so alan and i are just sort of more direct but there there's there was also this element of choosing an an art director and um one of the things that's really nice about our company is that we we do try to select somebody who is you know emotionally and aesthetically right for a particular project um and you know nick and i earlier today we were just talking about a particular um book that needs that needs a, a cover and we 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 collect images from designers um and and artists that we like and we run them by each other and um, you know, sometimes it's, it's brainstorming sessions or sometimes one of us sees something and, uh, you know, it, it, we try to be really open to the, to the, to the world of, of art and, and design and to share it with each other when, when we can, so that when that moment comes that it's the exact right project, we can put it together. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, I have 
a few more questions. I don't know. We supposed to close out around six, so I'm not sure how many questions we'll get to. So I'm going to think of a really good one to close Bye. off on. Um, okay. Um, I will probably say, who? what's a good one? Um, well, a question I wanted to know, because it seems both books are children based. What kind of, what made you guys want to write, work in the genre for children? Like what inspired you to do that? Um, and do you feel like it's important to solely work in the genre of children books? Or do you see yourself expanding past that? Past that? <laughs> Um, I'll just jump in and say there is no past that. This is this this is the center. This is it, um, and I think that it's. I think there's there are kind of two separate answers for me. One is, I, I think all of us who have who are in this have had some powerful experiences with books as young people, and they were important to us, and we they meant something to us, and that has stayed with us. And now we want to give back to those, those young people who we, who we were. Um, and so that's the emotional side. I think aesthetically and intellectually that books for young people are its own art form. Um, and it's, it's not a precursor to an adult art form. It, it is an art form. It's, so it's kind of like saying, well, when are you going to move on from sculpture to painting? You know, <laughs> um, uh, well, I, you know, maybe I will, but I kind of, you know, sculpture is really quite challenging and and beautiful, and and the thing I want to do. So that's that's the answer for me. My answer is is similar. It's th that feeling that you have as a child or as an adult when you are experiencing someone else's art in a meaningful way, translated into your desire to do that or give that to someone else, totally 100% why I want to make things. Um, and for the, and in terms of just a picture book, picture books are so hard. Uh, and uh, because my mom was an illustrator, we had our picture book section, we had our sanctioned section, and we also had the, um, what's that part of Harry Potter, the restricted section? We had a restricted kids book section. And I would go up to the studio and read these, and they were usually done, um, this was the 80s, so they would usually be done by sort of edgy graphic designers at the time who were illustrating text that was also a little bad. Like it, maybe we had some um, fairy tales where some gory stuff went down and you know blood was everywhere and you know those weren't really kids books either. I'm not even sure what books they weren't. I don't know who those were for, but I was sneaking upstairs to read them, so I guess they were for me. But you know, genres are hard to identify, and as a printmaker, somewhere between fine art and and graphic design, um, we're off, often not really sure where we land. And it's maybe not worth even trying to, to define. Just make the thing you're making and, and enjoy it. I don't think we can get any better than that. <laughs> so um, I want to thank everyone who came. Your questions were fabulous. The answers have been fabulous. Thank you so much from all our to all our guests from Levine Corrido for today's lively conversation. We learned so much. Thanks also to Ednetta for wonderful moderation and to the DC Public Libraries for this wonderful partnership. Don't forget, you can still click the links in the chat box to get your own copies of A is for B and Freedom, the story of the Black Panther Party. As an independent bookstore, we appreciate your support. Thank you so much and everyone have a lovely evening. Bye. Great to see you all. Thank you. Yay, okay. nice seeing you, everyone. Thank you all, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Annetta. Thank you, Annetta, that was great. Thank you. Really great I, I hope you meet my son. Yes, wait, what is his name? So I keep him on my radar. Max, Max, Max. Ferrante.
Max Lorette. If we're okay. still streaming, I just need to say that there were so many young adults that were in the Black Panther Party. I think that's right. What I was getting ready to say, it's really important yes. as a young adult book in particular, because so many of the people in the party were young people. And I just wanted yeah. to say that. <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. That's right. You get it? <laughs> Yes, thank you. All right. It's really nice seeing all of you. Thank you, Annetta. And thank oh you. gosh, I have to get your book, Ellen. I'm 